Fatima, can you confirm? There you are. Do you want to go ahead and put your uh, first? Share my screen? Yeah. And we, we do have a few minutes before the next scheduled talk. So if you don't mind me picking your brain a little bit while we wait um, yeah. and, and and chat just a little bit. Um, I know I've, I think the first time that I, that I got to um, see you speak was in uh, at CERN uh, when we were, were there, what, two years ago. Wow, it seems like forever. Um, and then I've had the opportunity to hear you speak um, a couple times and then see your your training sessions and, and things like that. Um, you're a longtime member of the community. You're a member of the Zeke LT now. Um, you also give other trainings about, you know, the introduction to Zeke and setting up Zeke. I think primarily I've seen your um, Ubuntu setups and things like that. Uh, you, you recently moved to, I believe, uh, ESNet um, to, to work there. Uh, can you tell folks a little bit, because um, I've heard you not use these exact words, but kind of like allude to this there, you know, in, in your day to day job and what you do, the magic of Zeke and how it kind of pulls things together. Can you without giving away your talk, can you talk about what makes Zeke so special to you as as a, uh, a cybersecurity professional? Uh, okay, so I can talk about Zeke all day long. I mean, there is so much information to share, but just a high level view. Zeke is one of its kind. Like uh, in the when I but I started my um, security engineer career at a university, and uh, a lot of universities do not have like whole lot of budget to buy like super expensive and cool tools that can give them enough visibility in their network, right? And even capturing packets full scale it's pretty expensive, right? Like you need to have a lot of disk and then you need to have somebody who is looking through the PCAPs to know what's going on. So it's pretty tricky and hard process to set up that kind of infrastructure that consumes, um, you know, that kind of like gives you that kind of uh, holistic vision of your network. And then Bro came into the picture and um, I, I, I always tell that story that I have not heard of Bro until I started uh, my job at University of Delaware. And one of the things that my manager was going through, one of the tasks that I was supposed to do in my job is monitoring uh, and creating Zeek scripts. And I still remember um, my dumb question that, do you, do you mean Pro and not Bro? And then he's like, no, Bro with a B. And I was like, well, that's a very interesting name for an IDS. But then I um, started looking at it and there were like a whole bunch of resources available that what is the capability of uh, Bro at that time and then how you can actually utilize it. So it was like a pretty quick start for me. And then when I started uh, analyzing more, the I got more appreciation on what uh, Zeek do for you and uh, what are its capabilities, like the amazing frameworks that it offers and the uh, scripting framework that, that helps you uh, and then makes you uh, um, expand, uh, extend the functionality of Zeek according to your use case. You can do log filtering and whatnot. So the whole bunch of things and whole bunch of frameworks that Zeek comes with makes it, makes it one of its own kind of tool, right? Like it gives you enough information to dig and investigate the incidents that are happening on your network and analyze the traffic and not overwhelming you with like whole bunch of PCAP and packets that you have to dig through it. So that is like a sweet spot for a security engineer or even a network professional that wants to track down some of the misconfigurations and what's going on on their network. So that was pretty amazing and mind blowing that, uh, you, uh, that institutions like universities who do not um, right on the budgets of like millions of dollars for uh, spending on security can actually take advantage of an open source and free tool that can give them enough visibility to do, to do their job. And that was like a very big um, revelation. And I was like, I, I, uh, I started getting more and more intrigued in Zeek development. And then I started contributing and then it started being a part of the member because that is one of the important things, right? Like when you keep using it and you don't contribute it, the kind of like life cycle of the project depends on community, right? Like if you can contribute back to the project and be an, be an active member, just to, you know, for me, it was like to show my uh, gratefulness that this is an amazing tool and we are using it and we use it so much and we, we get so much insights and whatnot. So we should contribute back to the tool and we should contribute back to the community, right? Like whatever we learn, even as a user, not a developer, you can contribute back to the community by, um, you know, sharing the use cases and by sharing and propagating the knowledge that what kind of things you can find with Zeek. 
So that was like, and again, I said, I can talk the whole day long about my journey with Zeek and how I got involved. But for me personally, it was like uh, one of its own kind of tool that I have seen in the uh, wild, which is open source and free, has amazing developer support and you can get your answers. Um, you can get your questions answered uh, by the developers and it's free and open source. You can join the mailing list. And even if you are a beginner, and I remember when I was starting with Zeek, I had all sorts of stupid questions and I, don't, I didn't even know how to start with Zeek and what are the basic error messages it triggers when it is misconfigured and how you can resolve them. So I, I remember I was, and when I go back and look, I look into those questions that I used to ask community, it kind of like embarrasses myself that, oh my God, I was so stupid when I was starting. But there is, this, there's a saying that there is no thing, there is no such thing as a stupid question. So it always kind of like, you know, puts me at ease that it's okay, it's the learning curve. You have to start from somewhere and you have to have people around you who are supportive and they are not like, we are not going to answer your stupid question because it is way too stupid for us, right? So amazing support from the Zeek developers and Zeek team kind of like was uh, one of the key factors of my little bit of success with Zeek. And I'm still a learner, so I still I try to learn more and more and uh, try to keep up with what's going on, what's going on with the project and all the cool stuff people are working on, like spicy and uh, the different kind of uh, plugins and whatnot. So it's a lot of ground and area to cover when you start with Zeek, but eventually you learn and you move forward. You know, um, I, I I don't think anybody is born with this knowledge. You know, like like we, we all start from some point, you know, like, you know, and I go back and I look at when I first, you know, started in open source to where I am today, it's hard to remember, you know, what it was like back then. And, um, you know, I see the things that you do and others on the LT and our developers and our community as a whole, you know, folks like Seth and updating the, the 17 packages that, you know, that he did and contributed back. So I think we're all learning. I don't think, it, I think when we're done learning, it's when we die. So, um, you know, never stop learning and never stop sharing. We still have a few minutes before the actual start of the talk. So I, I do have a couple more questions if you feel like answering some questions from the hip. Uh, sure, shoot it. Go ahead. So, so one of the things that I think I first saw you talk about was the weird logs. And, and um, when I saw this talk today um, and what you were speaking, I'm like, oh, she didn't submit anything on weird. But what was it about or what is it that continues to be your favorite thing about the weird logs? I mean, you've got 30 plus types of logs that you could really, you know, derive information from. But what made you like gravitate toward that particular log type? That's another interesting thing, right? As a security professional, you never go for anything normal and ordinary in your network. You are always looking for something special and abnormal thing that is going on in your network because that is what will catch your eye and that is what will help you investigate either if there is any uh, misconfiguration in the network or if there is any misconfiguration in application. And the goodness of Zeek lies in that, right? That although it has like more than 50 protocol parser and it generates like normal log files for them, there are some special kind of um, analysis that it does that actually uh, helps you investigate those kind of issues, right? So like abnormalities in the network. So as a networking person, you have a very um, black and white concept of how TCP should work, right? But in the practical scenario, when you are actually in the network, there is like all sort of all sort of weird situations that are not in any kind of bookish language that you come across. And then you investigate that why exactly this thing is happening on the network. And Zeek logs those special kind of um, scenarios where it says that, hey, this is something abnormal and this is something anomalous. I should actually log, log it down for the user, right? So those are the files that are very interesting uh, uh, as a security analyst perspective, right? Like, sure, there are like more than 50 log files, but they are very normal, ordinary day-to-day uh, -day traffic. But what's special is if you look into the weird dot or notice dot or Intel, if you have Intel framework enabled, you can actually see all those um, uh, all those outliers in your network that, hey, something is going on in your network and Zeek is not happy about it. And given that given that Zeek is totally based on the heuristics and analysis of the protocols via RFC, verbatim, there is something that is not complying with the RFCs, right? So, and that's the, that's the crown jewel for security and network engineers to actually go through those log files that are special uh, in, their, uh, in their kind and then investigate uh, and kind of like, backtrace it that what exactly is going on because either it will give you peace of mind that okay my network is fine it's just like there is some false positives that i need to ignore 
or it will actually reveal some information that, hey, this was actually a true positive. And when you started uh, investigating it, you actually found an, a way to improve your network. So this is either one of the two ways you can go with the um, analysis of weird and special log files that Zeek generates. And that's one of the important um, plus points of running Zeek that apart from the normal heuristics, it actually gives you some uh, interesting heuristics that, that are going on in your network. So, and, and as a, yeah, yeah, as I said, as a security engineer, you actually go for those kind of files that can show you something that is not normal happening in your network. And weird is one of those files that you can start looking and digging through your network and see why exactly your network is so noisy and all these different hundred types of weirds are triggering. Of course, there, there might be cases that some of them are false positive, which I have talked about in my previous talks with weird, but there might be some cases where actually you can find misconfigurations and um, anomalous behavior in your network which I have again covered in my old talks where I have shown people that, hey, you should not ignore weird.log file. It's actually a pretty useful file and you should take a look at it. And today's talk as well, like I cover some part of um, weird analysis and then how it led to some other uh, traffic investigation uh, with Zeek. Weird log never disappoints me. Like if you are trying to get something fun and exciting for your job, just start looking at weird and it will all of a sudden, you know, it will, Write up your day and lighten up your day as a security you, engineer. You know, I think the description weird just sums it up. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, whether it's log types or something in your day to day life that is quote unquote weird, it adds excitement to to your life. Now, some people may look at that as positive, some may look at that as, as negative, but you know, weird anything keeps life interesting. Um, and with that, we've got about three minutes before the start of your talk. So we'll go ahead and, and, and get, get that started. I know folks are commenting in the channel that they're enjoying kind of the pre-show here, but I want to, you know, go ahead and let you take the floor. And uh, so let me introduce you correctly. So when we do the, the video, we have the correct uh, introduction. Sure. A quick question. Can you see my slide deck? I, am I sharing the right screen? You okay. are, you are. And can you just bump your sound up just a little bit? How is it now? It, it, it's good for me, but um, we had some folks saying that on the recording or, you know, even on their um, screen, I guess they didn't have their sound turned up as loud as I do. And some of the talks are coming across a little, a little soft for them. So just want to make sure that you can be helped. Okay. Let me introduce you correctly for the video and we'll, we'll go from there. Cool. Welcome everybody to, uh, the third talk of Zeek Week for today. Today we have Fatima Benatwala. Uh, she's a security engineer with the SNAT. She's gonna be talking about DNS and traffic investigation with Zeek. Fatima is a longtime member of the community. She's a member of the Zeek LT and has contributed um, lots of content uh, and helps the community with introduction to Zeek. Many of you may have been in her training yesterday. And so with that, Fatima, take it away. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amber, for the great introduction. So I will not um, talk a lot about myself. As Amber mentioned, I'm a security engineer right now with ESNet. It's been one and a half years, and it's been an amazing journey. It's been an amazing journey so far. So quickly diving into the talk. So weird history. Um, I have been talking about weird for past three years now. So I will not go into the very detail of what weird is and how you should investigate because those things have already been covered. And since I have a very like small um, uh, window to cover the stuff. I will not deep dive into uh, what exactly weird is, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of background of what weird is. Uh, so if you're not familiar with weird in Zeek, it is it is unusual or exceptional activity that can indicate malform uh, that can indicate malform connections or traffic that doesn't conform to a protocol to a particular protocol, a malfunctioning or misconfigured hardware, or even an attacker attempting to um, avoid or confuse your Zeek sensor. And as part of the normal network monitoring uh, that Zeek does, it, uh, it generates weird.log as part of it. So you don't have to enable something very explicit in your network for Zeek to log that log file for you. It's automatically done by weird. Uh, it's automatically done by Zeek when it sees, sees those weird patterns in your traffic. So um, yeah, so it's when whenever Zeek sees something that is worth noting in weird, it will just log down. Uh, it will just log down and trigger a weird in weird.log file for you to later on take a look at. So why it matters? Um, analyzing the weird logs might reveal information about uh, some activity that is hard to notice in your day-to-day -day, uh, life of network and uh, network or security engineer. As I was mentioning with Ember before, that as a security engineer, you always want to go for um, the log files that are abnormal, right? The, the log files that do not confirm 
to the normal traffic. Of course, Z has more than 50 protocol uh, parsers and it generates really cool log files for them, but it's just like day to day ordinary traffic. So if you explicitly want to see and add some fun, you can actually start looking at uh, the weird.log file uh, in your day to day job. And, uh, and investigating them actually might reveal a network or application misconfigurations, which can then lead to some kind of improvements in your overall network. Or if it's a false positive, you can at least have ease in the mind that, okay, I know that this, uh, this activity is happening, but it's kind of like false positive in my network, my particular network. All right, so before jumping in, it's important to um, discuss that where exactly our taps are and what traffic Zeke sees, because then it will make sense when I will discuss the weird and how we investigated and analyzed them. So this is the data center setup. So we have two data centers at East, one is at East Coast and, East Coast and the second one is at the West Coast. And uh, we have taps between our distribution switch and the um, core router. So primarily Zeke nodes are getting the East West traffic of our network that is getting load balanced with Arista and then properly uh, getting load balance to the Zeek nodes and they're, in the, they're, they're analyzing that traffic. So the, these are 10 gig links and uh, yeah, the taps are between our core switch, core router and the distribution switch. So we can expect not some of the no, uh, internet traffic coming in and out from our uh, data center and mostly the east-west traffic uh, that is uh, going uh, between our distribution switch and the uh, router. Interesting weird ana analysis. So the good part is in ESNet, we do not get whole ton of weirds, uh, unique weirds log. I think it's like hardly we see unique, uh, like 50 or 55 unique weirds per day. Uh, and we investigate the most triggered weirds usually. And then uh, we, we then go from there. So a couple of months ago, we were analyzing the weird.log file. And those were the three important weirds that got triggered we, that we actually started analyzing. So, and I will go into the detail of each one and how we uh, what we found out when we were analyzing it or whether it was true positive or false positive. So data after reset, DNS are unknown type and TCP act under flow or misorder were the three weird types that we investigated in past few months. Okay, so data after reset analysis. For those of you who do not know where exactly uh, the weirds are defined in Zeek, there are primarily two places where the uh, where weirds are kind of like defined. And from defined, what I mean is if you're really investigating, investigating a weird, you have to see if the condition that is triggering that weird and getting logged in weird.log is a true positive or false positive, right? So if you are really curious and if you are, if you want to know what condition triggered that weird, you can actually look at the source files. And one of the locations that weird is defined is source files. So if you have compiled Zeek from source, you can go through the source file and try to grab that weird uh, name. Uh, uh, from the source file and you will get to know where exactly it is defined. So for data after reset, if you look into the um, source slash analyzer slash protocol, it is defined in the tcp.cc file. So the condition is defined there. And then when that condition is met, the Z triggers the weird and it is getting logged in weird.log file. So the cause, as the name suggests, the weird names are pretty descriptive in itself. So you don't have to go through the, uh, and look for the condition every time it, uh, it triggers. So data after reset, is uh, triggered when Zeek sees a data packet uh, after seeing a reset packet for the connection. That means it is not complying with the normal teardown of the TCP connection, right? Um, seeing the traffic. So once the weird is triggered, we try to we start analyzing our traffic to see are there any specific patterns that are getting um, that weird trigger in the log files. So majority of time, since I said that we monitor east-west traffic from our uh, taps that goes into the Zeek majority of the traffic that was triggering that weird was our uh, internal traffic that was like internal VLAN traffic. Um, yeah, and you can see the number, I have just masked the IP addresses, but they are internal, network, like one address in one VLAN and the second address in the second VLAN under our distribution switch. So the reason for data after reset. So um, what happens is if you have a system in one VLAN behind a distribution switch that wants to communicate to a system in another VLAN behind the distribution switch, it is going to send the packet out which will get rerouted from the router back into the distribution switch, right? And if you have taps on those lines, you are going to see the packet twice. And that's what was happening. We were able, we were seeing the duplicate packets from those taps and those duplicate packets were getting load balanced to the Zeek nodes. So data after reset was happening because Zeek was seeing a, a data packet, a duplicate data packet after it saw a first reset of the connection. So now we knew that, okay, we are seeing duplicate traffic, which is intervalent traffic, and it is getting load balanced to Zeek, which is causing the most uh, noisiest uh, data after uh, reset triggered in our weird.log file. Okay, um, so resolution. Um, I'm just 
trying to watch for the time. Uh, resolution was, uh, there is just only one resolution. Uh, either you should uh, re-architecture the position of your taps in the network that where exactly you want to tap the network so that you can avoid uh, the you, you, you avoid seeing the duplicated packet going back and forth from the taps. Or if you do not want to do that, you can actually write some complex ingress and outgress filters on your, um, the, in our case, Arista, that was our load balancer. Uh, so we tried that. We tried to write some complex ingress and egress filters on Arista's tap aggregation group for WAN and LAN tap. And then we were just trying to see if we get reduced uh, noise uh, for the duplicate traffic. That change we did on a Friday around 16th April, I think around afternoon. And then we just we just said that, okay, it's just like our passive monitoring, even if we put the wrong filter, more, majority of the time, like what will happen is you will just not see the traffic. So we were just testing it out. So it was Friday afternoon, we put the filter and then um, we thought that next week we will come back and see if we see the dip in the uh, data after reset weird. So well, uh, when we came back on Monday uh, and we started seeing the starting started mapping out the weird, we all of a sudden saw a new weird that got popped up and it just spiked through the weekend and that was TCP act underflow or mis or misorder. So we were nervous that maybe our change actually triggered something else that is now responsible for uh, spiking that weird in our in our network. So we started analyzing that now, we started analyzing the second weird now, but although even that weird was, that first uh, TCP act underflow weird was triggering throughout the, um, the weekend, we actually saw a dip in data after reset. That means our filters were working. That means Zeek was not uh, seeing the duplicate traffic, most of the duplicate traffic anymore. And this graph actually plots, um, this is, a, this is the graph that plots the um, weird TCP act underflow and it's trend over the weekend. So from Sunday, April 18th, then uh, on Monday till eight. So something definitely happened on Monday morning at 8 a.m. that actually, you know, um, dead out that weird. So something changed on Monday morning that kind of like got rid of the weird. But during the whole weekend, we saw like whole bumps and spikes in that weird that we have never seen before in our weird.log file. Okay, so since that was triggering, we our first guess was let's go back and check what is actually causing that weird to trigger. So we started analyzing the log files that Zeke was uh, generating over the weekend. And starting with the connection logs, we got the uh, statistics of topmost source or topmost destination that was triggering that weird. And we realized that the 99% of the traffic that was triggering the TCP act under the weird was uh, from the Libre NMS folder to the Libre NMS server. So for those of you who do not know what Libre NMS is, it's a service, uh, just high level view that it's a network monitoring um, software that you deploy on your network. It's like a clusterized service that has different components in it. And one component of it is a polar that actually goes out in your network, pulls your host, and then brings that information back to the server and then pushes it out to the server and writes the file on the server, uh, whatever information it has collected on your network. So 99% of the traffic was coming from the polar and going to the server. And we knew that there is something wrong with our liver animus cluster there. Uh, I was able to capture, and that was the only thing that was inferred from the logs. So I tried to capture a PCAP from one of our uh, bro workers that was seeing that traffic and that was triggering that weird. And I was able to capture the PCAP and we were looking through the connections that what is exactly happening to those connections and realized that I have not seen SAR connection before. So if you guys are familiar with the connection log, con.log file, it has a history field in it. And it's uh, it records the history of the packets sent from the originator to responder and then back from responder to originator. And the capitalized version, like capital S, it means the sent packet from the originator. And then this small version of the um, letters uh, say the other way around, like, a, a stands for acknowledgement, and it is coming from the responder to source, and then the reset from source to respond. I have not seen that history before, so that was one of one of the interesting points to see that why exactly we are seeing that history for those connections. And then the second important point was the port. So we knew that the IP is from Polar, the destination is Polar, ser uh, Polar server, uh, NMS server, and that the port was 42217, which is um, there's a service called RRD cache that runs on the Libre NMS server that, that deals with the reading and writing of the files to the, um, to the server. And that service runs on that port. So we exactly knew that there is some problem with that service. Okay, so the reason, um, the reason was our Libre NMS server was running into the out of memory issues during the same period of time when we saw the spike in the TCP act underflow weird. 
And all the connections from the polars were either flat hung up on the server or the kernel was silently killing the PIDs to deal with the, uh, to be, to deal with the swapping and out of memory issue on the server. And that was the reason for the SAR connections. Uh, the clients were sending SINs to create a new connection, but since the connections were already established, the server was, the server was responding back with an act. And the clients were responding, uh, and the client were responding um, with a reset to, to that act, trying to get the established connection go away from the server, and then resending a SIN to create a new connection. It was hard for me to wrap my head around the SAR connections, and I struggled to understand what exactly it means. And then Vlad actually pointed me to an article that actually discussed that it is possible to end up with a server in established state and the client in closed state if the connection is lost or time out on the client. And the client, in, uh, in order to attempt a new connection, uh, in order to open a new connection in this scenario, would cause a SYN packet to be received in the established state on the server. Which was precise, which precisely explained what was going on with the um, LibreNS folder and the LibreNS server when the server ran out of the memory. Um, so the resolution uh, was pretty easy. The INF team or intra infrastructure team knew about the issue and they actually took off the cluster on the morning of Monday. So right after 8 a.m., when we didn't see any weird happening, like the flat line on the on the graph. That was the time when the cluster was taken off the uh, taken off the network and then. Uh, the infrastructure team was troubleshooting the server and bringing it back to the life. So the interesting lesson learned here is you can actually use your NSM tool to help you uh, check for the health of your monitoring tool. So that was pretty interesting uh, find that, okay, we use Zeek to kind of like troubleshoot our monitoring systems that are actually responsible for monitoring our network. Okay, last but not the least, DNS are a known type. Uh, we do not get a whole lot right now triggered in our network. Mostly we have uh, gotten, uh, uh, like we have gotten rid of, like we have, uh, uh, we do not kind of like get too much of weird other types, but we still get couple every now and then. And we were just trying to, uh, you know, add support to those so that we kind of like get the rid of the DNS are a known type totally from our weird.log file. Uh, that's the weird, as the name suggests, uh, it's triggered when Zeek doesn't know how to parse a, a resource RR type uh, in the DNS traffic. And the good part is it actually logs the additional uh, value of the DNS RR type ID that it is not able to parse. So you can actually take a look and see what exactly are the types that uh, Zeek doesn't have parsing support for. In our case, there were like four types that we saw in our ne network that kind of like trigger every now and then, which is like 29, 51, 65534 and 44. So the reason is pretty straightforward. C doesn't have currently parsing support for those R types. And those R type IDs correspond to correspond to these uh, type names. So 29 is the location record. Uh, it specifies the um, geographical location associated with the domain name. 51 is NSEC3 uh, param, uh, which is like which is the record that contains the parameters for the next uh, secure record version 3 protocol not protocol, the, the other type that DNS has. Uh, 65534 is a private type, uh, which is defined in bind nine. And bind nine uses that special private type to uh, signal the state of signing process. It is only seen on in the zone transfer DNS request, and only if you have implemented DNS tech on your DNS servers. 44 is SSH fingerprinting. Uh, it contains the um, public, uh, it, it, contains the, it contains the SSH uh, host public key fingerprint in it. And we were seeing all those four, side, four types which are not getting parsed. So the parsing support was uh, implemented and contributed back to Zeek in the, I think the last end of last year. And it should be available now in Zeek 4.0 and above. So if you run uh, Zeek 4.0 Zeek above, then you should have the parsing support for those four types. Again, they're pretty, they're not, they're, they're, they're not pretty noisy, but still we get them a couple, uh, couple of times every now and then. So we just uh, try to add support for it. Okay, finally, the last topic I wanted to cover was uh, interesting DNS, uh, DNS connections. So when we were doing the DNS uh, traffic analysis uh, that were triggered in the weird.log file, we came across some interesting connections. And those connections were type of, uh, as I have noted, x.y to x.y minus one. That means the last octet of source IP was one greater than the last octet of the destination IP, which clearly shows that it's the intra-VLAN traffic. 
and you do not see intravenous traffic on either of your taps, firewall, or a router, right? Because it's intravenous, it should not even hit the taps because it should be within the um, local VLAN. And they were all DNS connections. They were proper DNS connections without any problem. It was just that the IP addresses were throwing us off. That why is, why is that kind of uh, things happening uh, in our in our network? So it turns out that the reason is. Uh, there are people uh, that work for the Close Resolver project who have devised a novice way to um, use DNS to scan for uh, the uh, source address validation across the internet. So source address validation scanning means that if they find, uh, if they scan and then if they find, uh, the, if they find that there are some uh, networks that do not have, um, inbound uh, swoosh packet filtering enabled, then they will get to know about it. And there's a whole a whole big blog post in detail that how they do that and why they use that uh, that type where uh, that kind of traffic where the octet of the, the, the spoofed source IPs octet is one more than the destination IP. And they go into the very detail of how they have implemented it and why they have implement, implemented it and what they have found so far in that blog post. And I don't have that enough time to go through it. So I have just provided a link. So if people are interested, they can go through it and see how they're using DNS. That's definitely a one, one of the off-label DNS use cases I have seen. Uh, and the de detection. So we were seeing that traffic uh, for our east-west cluster. So we wrote detection scripts for uh, east-west traffic and north-south traffic. So the spoofed east-west.zeek script should detect the spoofed traffic, uh, which is intra-VLAN. So that the exact same traffic that we saw in the last slide which is intra-VLAN, and then the north-south will uh, log the traffic that is inter-VLAN or local to local. And one thing to note here is uh, we and ESnet have multi-cluster uh, setup. So these scripts are just specifically for the single site, uh, not multi-cluster, sorry, multi-site deployments. So these scripts are exclusively for single site deployment. That means if you have your um, local, uh, if you have just one site where you have, uh, you have you, all your uh, network IPs are contained in that site, so that's another thing to note. Uh, and that actually, I'm right on time, at least at least three minutes earlier. But acknowledgements, uh, I know I have been very quick and I've just breezed through some of the slides. Uh, I just wanted to um, thank uh, the Awesome Zeek team for the amazing support and uh, being uh, giving me an opportunity to be a presenter in Zeek Week 21 um, this year as well. So thanks you. Thank you for uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, I can take some questions if there are any. I haven't been paying attention to, to the chat, but if there are any burning questions that I can, that I can answer in the next three minutes, I would be more than happy to. Um, I think the most interesting comment in the channel was when Seth said he didn't know about SAR. So if Seth wasn't uh, wasn't aware of that and learned that too, then um, it just goes to show you it doesn't matter how long you've been using Zeek, you can learn something new every day. So so thank you so much for your um, for your talk. And I'll let you pop over into the Slack channel and we'll bring Jeff up to uh, 